Seeing the demand for low-budget features, sales manager James H. Nicholson and entertainment lawyer Samuel Z. Arkoff formed American Releasing Corporation, or ARC, in 1954. Initially, they released films they thought would have a wide appeal. Movies like Operation Malaya, Outlaw Treasure, and crime dramas like The Fast and the Furious. These movies all underperformed, and the studio was losing money. Hoping to fix their issues, they spent some time doing market research. They investigated various movie trends and discovered there was an enormous untapped market. Teenagers. Through their research, they found that adults were staying at home to watch television, and it was the teenagers who were going out to the movies. So they decided the best way to be profitable was to make the movies that this demographic would be interested in. What was it that they wanted to see? Low-budget trash. Not bad movies, per se. Just movies that most adults weren't interested in, and therefore, they'd call them low-budget trash. In order to appeal to this demographic, Arkoff came up with the Arkoff formula. Each of his movies had to have all of these. Action. Revolution. Killing. Oratory. Fantasy. And the most important, fornication. Later, the publicity department came up with another strategy. This was... A younger child will watch anything an older child will watch. An older child will not watch anything a younger child will watch. A girl will watch anything a boy will watch. A boy will not watch anything a girl will watch. Therefore, to catch your greatest audience, you zero in on the 19-year-old male. They called this the Peter Pan Syndrome. Say what you will about this shrewd business tactic, but in the 50s, this was absolutely true. ARC stopped making westerns and became AIP, American International Pictures. They made low-budget creature features designed to be for teenage boys. The heads of AIP would concoct a title they thought sounded like a hit film. If it worked, they'd hire a writer to take the title and deliver a script. What they ended up with was movies like Invasion of the Saucer Men, Terror from the Year 5000, and Earth vs. the Spider. Arkoff focused largely on monster movies. Movies that were made to exploit the fears of the American public at the time. In the 1950s, there were three major things that everyone was afraid of. The biggest fear was that your next-door neighbor was a secret communist. That gave rise to big movies like Invasion of the Body Snatchers and Invaders from Mars. AIP made their version as It Conquered the World. Next up was The Atom Bomb. This manifested itself as giant thing movies, now most often referred to as kaiju movies. Radiation would mutate nature, and we'd end up with things like giant ants, giant people, and Godzilla. This led to things like tentacles. Lastly was aliens. Not the kind of aliens we think of today, this was the 50s interpretation of aliens. That weird thing from outer space that would land in our backyard and eventually take over the world. Something like the blob or the brain eaters. AIP made numerous films over the years until eventually being bought out by the company Filmways in the 70s. Filmways was later bought by Orion, and the AIP films were acquired by MGM. Fast forward ahead several decades. Lou Arkoff, Samuel Arkoff's son, wanted to take some of his father's exploitation films and update them. He took this idea to the cable network Showtime, and the end result was the made-for-cable movie series Rebel Highway. They took 10 of his father's films from the 50s and 60s and updated them to the 1990s. These were a wide variety of popular genres, from greaser or street punk movies, to women in prison, to delinquent girl movies. Rebel Highway aired over the summer of 1994. Some of the films had well-established directors like William Friedkin and Joe Dante, while others had up-and-coming indie directors like Robert Rodriguez. After this, Arkoff decided he wanted to continue the idea but this time to focus on the monster movies from his father's catalog. The monster films from that era of AIP were much more successful, and he thought there was greater potential for them to be updated. The next part of this story started in a very unusual place. The live-action adaptation of Inspector Gadget. Arkov was a co-producer, and he met with Shane Mahan, the effects supervisor for the film. Mahan approached him when he found out he was the son of Samuel Arkov. He grew up watching those old creature features and had tons of questions. Lou was impressed that he knew so much about the AIP films. He also found out that Mahan worked for visual effects legend Stan Winston. Arkoff was able to set up a meeting with Winston to pitch his updated AIP movie Monsters idea to continue and expand upon the concept started with Rebel Highway. 
to take the titles of a handful of films and make entirely new movies, monster movies that would reflect the fears of today. The timing of this couldn't have been better for Winston. Back in 1997, Stan Winston Productions was formed. He was already in negotiations to work on a series of direct-to-cable films, but didn't have anything specific lined up yet. At the same time, Winston was also looking to get into the toy business. He was sad to see all these licensed characters he worked on being made into poor-quality toys. After working on Small Soldiers with Joe Dante, Winston had a brilliant idea. Why not start his own toy company? He could make high-quality figures for the older collectible market. Something that used the actual molds from the films to match the same level of detail in the toys. However, getting that off the ground was an overwhelming task, and Winston was already spread thin. He wanted to work on the idea, and spoke about it to a few people, but just never got around to doing it. Then he saw the Spawn toys. Todd McFarlane had his very successful line of Spawn toys and action figures taken from his massively successful comic series. McFarlane started a toy company called Todd Toys, which about a year later was changed to McFarlane Toys due to pressure from the toy company Mattel. They cited the name Todd Toys would create brand confusion as it was too close to Barbie's younger brother. I didn't even know Barbie had a younger brother. Anyway, the Spawn Toys were a huge hit, so he followed that up with the spin-off Movie Maniacs. These were high-quality toys based on R-rated properties and were aimed at the older collectible market. McFarlane required the rights to properties like A Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, and even Pumpkinhead, a monster Winston created for the movie he directed. Winston saw the movie Maniacs and realized that was something he should have already been doing, and this motivated him to start his own toy line. Although instead of going after the licensed market, Winston decided to create new, original creatures. He was hoping these toys would explode in popularity, which would lead to other avenues like comics, t-shirts, lunchboxes, and so on. This was an opportunity to create his own intellectual properties. This was something he'd been wanting to do since the 70s. He had entire folders full of art and design concepts for original fantasy worlds and all the characters within. Now with the prospect of making these films with Arkov, they could create new monsters and use them to launch the toy line. They called the project Creature Features. Lou Arkoff, Stan Winston, and actress-producer Colleen Camp formed Creature Features Productions, LLC. Arkoff had a deal with Cinemax. They would develop 10 screenplays based on the titles of his father's old films. Then Cinemax would choose the five they liked the most, which they would then continue to flesh out. Someone would pitch the idea, and if they liked it, they gave that person a chance to write a treatment. If they liked the treatment, Winston's team would then go off and develop ideas for the monster. Each of the films would focus heavily on whatever the monster was that Winston's team created. They presented 10 scripts to Cinemax, but they chose the following five. Earth vs. the Spider, The Day the World Ended, How to Make a Monster, Teenage Caveman, and War the Colossal Beast. Classic Mystery Science Theater 3000 fans were aware of almost all of these. Each of the scripts had stories that were major departures from the originals. 1958's Earth vs. the Spider was about a bunch of high school students teaming up with their science teacher to fight off a giant mutant spider that invaded their small town. Not so much Earth vs. the Spider, but Rural Town vs. the Spider doesn't have the same ring. The new Earth vs. the Spider is about a guy who's obsessed with comic books. He works at a research facility and injects himself with an untested formula which then gives him spider powers. He thinks this is great because he grew up reading comics and now is a real-life superhero. All is fine and good until he starts to turn into a giant spider. It was written to be like a different take on the origin of Spider-Man, where instead of becoming a hero, everything goes wrong like in Cronenberg's The Fly. 1955's The Day the World Ended is about seven people trying to survive in a small survivalist camp after a nuclear war. The new version is about a misunderstood alien that is killing people in a small town. The locals look into it and find the alien is telepathically linked to a young boy. 1958's How to Make a Monster is about a monster makeup artist who gets fired by his new bosses at the studio where he works. He then uses some of his creations to get revenge on the executives. The new version is about an evil video game that comes to life so it can kill the developers. 1958's Teenage Caveman is about a young caveman that goes on a quest for knowledge. In the end, he discovers this is not the past, but the future. 
The world has been destroyed in a nuclear war, and the inhabitants have been bombed back to the Stone Age where they're rebuilding. The new version we know takes place after the apocalypse. A bunch of teenagers are thrown out of their village and essentially go on rumspringa. They find a guy and his girlfriend living in decadence and depravity. These are two test subjects from before the war that have been living here alone for decades. The subjects infect the new kids with a virus where one of two things happens. You either live forever as a teenage caveman, or you explode. 1958's War of the Colossal Beast is a sequel to The Amazing Colossal Man. The man who became huge and died at the end of the first movie is back. Only messed up looking, and he goes on a colossal rampage across Mexico. The new version is about two Irish carnies that abduct a mermaid and bring her to America. While on their way there, the mermaid possesses some of the crew and manipulates them into murdering each other. They realized it didn't make sense to keep the original title, so they changed it to another AIP film, The She-Creature. While there'd be a lot of talent behind these productions, they were still going to be very low-budget features. So rather than hire established directors, which would raise the cost of the production, they decided it would be more interesting to hire some newer up-and-coming directors from the independent scene. Arkov started going to various film festivals looking for directors he felt would fit the project. The movies were going to be done quick and cheap. The plan was for each film to be shot in 18 days on a budget rumored to be under a million dollars. They had to be willing to work hard and fast, shooting five to six pages a day, many days including monsters and various effects. It was not going to be easy. After some interviews, they had their directors lined up. Scott Zeal would direct Earth vs. the Spider. He had recently directed Broken Vessels, which was nominated for Best Foreign Independent Film and won the Audience Award for Best Feature Film at the LA Independent Film Festival. Terry Gross would direct The Day the World Ended. He directed the film Hotel Splendid with two relative young unknowns, Tony Collette and Daniel Craig. The movie won two awards at the 2000 Sitges Independent Film Festival. Sebastian Gutierrez was hired to direct She Creature. He wrote and directed Judas Kiss in 1998, a movie which starred Alan Rickman, Emma Thompson, and Carla Gugino. He won the Critics Award at the 1999 Cognac Crime Film Festival. George Huang wrote and directed How to Make a Monster. Before that, he wrote and directed the award-winning black comedy Swimming with Sharks in 1994, which won multiple independent awards. In 1997, he directed the teen comedy Trojan War. Rounding out the directors, they hired Larry Clark for Teenage Caveman. Clark co-wrote and directed the very controversial film Kids in 1995. Kids was nominated for multiple awards. Now they had to look into casting. Much like the choices for directing, they looked for up-and-coming actors and actresses to be in the movies. Clay Duvall, Tyler Maine, Andrew Keegan, Bobby Edner, and John Cho. Some of them were established but lesser known at the time, like Carla Gugino, Gil Bellows, Reno Wilson, Rufus Sewell, Devin Gummersall, and others. Beyond that, they were able to bring in a few well-known names, Natasha Kinski, Randy Quaid, Teresa Russell, and the biggest name they got was Dan Aykroyd. Aykroyd was hired to play Detective Jack Grillo in Earth vs. the Spider. Initially, he wasn't interested in doing a direct-to-cable film, but when he found out about the AIP connection, he signed on immediately. Aykroyd spoke about how he grew up watching the old Arkoff films when he was young. He said, What red-blooded North American boy who grew up from 1955 onward didn't love science fiction? While all this was going on, Winston's team were hard at work on the monsters. The artists that were working on the monster designs were some of the best in the business. These were people who worked on major films like Jurassic Park, The Terminator, and Predator, just to name a few. All five movies had new original designs coming from Winston Studios. Looking back to the toys, Winston wanted to do something special that would make them stand out even more. The toys would come with a CD-ROM pack-in that had videos talking about the movie and showing how the creature was designed with insight from the artist. Keep in mind, this was pre-YouTube, so seeing these kind of behind-the-scenes videos was rare at the time. They planned on having the toys and movies launch at the same time. Creature Features made a deal with Toys R Us, who would be the exclusive distributor of the toys. All five movies were set to be shot in Cypress Park, just north of Los Angeles. They acquired a building that used to be offices that they were able to repurpose and use as sets. Other areas in the location would be for the effect crews and the other workers. 
They announced the movies over the summer and planned to air them in the fall starting in October of 2001, the perfect time to release a series of creature features. Unfortunately, there was a problem with the toy line. They weren't going to be ready to launch in time with the movies. And then something else entirely out of their control completely derailed them. 9-11, the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. Despite these two issues, they went ahead with their original release schedule. Originally, they were going to air the first four on Cinemax on Thursday nights, and then release the fifth one on HBO. However, that deal changed, and all the movies ran on HBO. They started with She-Creature on October 4th, 2001. They extended the title to be The Mermaid Chronicles Part 1, She-Creature. They were very confident this would be the start of a breakout franchise. Then Earth vs. the Spider on October 7th. How to Make a Monster, October 14th. Now the films have been out for a little while and the reviews were coming in. She-Creature got a mix of both positive and negative reviews, which made it the best review to the bunch. For the others, they received almost all negative reviews. With the audience and the critics both not liking the films, they delayed the last two. The Day the World Ended was released on November 23rd. I couldn't get a definitive date for Teenage Caveman, other than it was released sometime in December of 2001. Teenage Caveman ended up getting more press than the others, due to just how controversial it was. In pure Larry Clark form, it's full of nudity, and there's an orgy sequence that goes on for far too long. Many critics were saying that much like Clark's other films, it showed that no matter what genre he tries to do, he always seems to find a way to make it about teenagers having sex. These movies were channeling the vibe of the old AIP films, and while they were focusing on more current fears, audiences weren't really in the mood for this kind of entertainment, especially after a brand new current fear. Beyond that, many felt that they were simply low-budget trash. That may have worked in the 50s, but it wasn't going over now. Critics and audiences pretty much hated the movies, but gave credit to the creature designs. Stan Winston and his team really went all out on the creatures, and they were by far the best parts of the movies. Unfortunately, they weren't enough to carry them completely. Speaking of, with the delays of getting the toys into stores and the movies not going over so well, the monsters all sat on the shelf collecting dust. Part of the deal they made with Toys R Us was that the toys were going to be placed on the coveted end cap, which was where they sat for quite a while before eventually going to the bargain bin. The movies were all released on DVD in 2002 and then re-released over the years. Some are out of print, but most are either available on Amazon or eBay. None of them are streaming. The DVD for Teenage Caveman had about a minute of sex removed from the broadcast version. Before the first series aired, Arkov already had the next batch lined up. Voodoo Woman, The Brain Eaters, Viking Women and the Sea Serpent, The Undead, and The Real... War of the Colossal Beast. With all five of the previous films underperforming, none of these were ever made. The studio decided to leave the project at essentially one season. It was an experiment that sadly didn't work. Despite that, Winston was determined to keep the toy line going. He decided to follow this up with some of his other creative designs. First up was Realm of the Claw. He based this on an idea he'd been developing since the 70s. It was about cat gods who defend the animal kingdom. He was also planning a comic book tie-in and movie. Much like the previous Creature Feature line, they had very lackluster sales. And even though this was only Wave 1, the rest of the waves were cancelled. With two very expensive failures, Winston put the toys on hold and set his sights elsewhere. Video games. He was pitching some of his toy ideas for video games, but none of them were picked up. Winston's team was contacted by Surreal Software to help them with a game they were working on. His team took their existing ideas and Stan Winstonized them. That is, gave them greater detail and made them more unsettling. The game was originally called Unspeakable, but it evolved and was released in 2004 as The Suffering. There was also a sequel, The Suffering The Ties That Bind, in 2005. Shortly before the second game was released, MTV Films announced a collaboration with Stan Winston Studios to turn The Suffering into a feature film. There was a lot of initial buzz around this, but it seemed to never progress beyond that announcement, and the project was cancelled. As for the toys, Winston had so many other things in mind. He worked on a series called Blood Wolves, 
which featured four original takes on werewolves by four different special effects artists. Extreme Gargoyles, Mutant Earth, my personal favorite, Alien Universe, and a line of killer robot figures. Blood Wolves, Extreme Gargoyles, and Mutant Earth toys were all made in limited quantities, but the killer robots in Alien Universe never made it into production. All these toy lines were connected by a monster hunter named Track, who got his own limited comic book series, Track Monster Hunter, in 2003. There was yet another series that didn't make it into production, Monster Mythologies. This was a wave of action figures that were new interpretations of classic fantasy creatures. Winston poured a lot of heart, soul, and creativity into all these ideas, and it seemed that none of them took off. There are fans who love them, but for most people, even fans of Winston's work, they aren't even aware they exist. Sadly, Stan Winston died on June 15, 2008, of multiple melioma, which is a cancer of the plasma cells. Winston worked on some of the most beloved movies of all time, and when people bring up his legacy, Creature Features is almost never mentioned. I understand why they aren't as beloved as his other works, but I don't think they should be overlooked. Winston was born in 1946 and was a teenager in the 50s and 60s. He grew up on these kinds of films, which played a part in him getting into visual effects. These films and toys were a way for him to try and bring back some of that weird low-budget magic from the era. It may not have worked, but at least the attempt was made to do something unique. Stan Winston's creature features may not be the thing that most people remember him for, but that doesn't mean that they should be forgotten. The whole thing was from a time where a series of talented people were given free reign to be as creative as they wanted. Unfortunately, they were at the mercy of time and budget. Beyond that, I'm shocked that Winston's other toy lines never took off. I want to say they were ahead of their time, but with McFarlane's stuff out at the same time, and that's not the issue. Maybe they were too creative. Perhaps if he did some license works first to get people interested, and then trot out new designs. Who knows? As for the movies, I'm one of the people who genuinely enjoyed the creature features. Yes, they were, for lack of a better term, low-budget trash. But I love low-budget trash. I'd rather have low-budget trash than what we currently get, large-budget trash. It was at least inventive trash. They made readaptations of five old films and made them into something else entirely. They also gave some up-and-coming actors and directors a shot to see how they could work under pressure. The movies ended up not hurting the careers of any of the actors or directors, and they've all moved on to bigger things. Well, except for Clark. He can't seem to stop making films about teenagers doing it. Shoot you.